Muy buenos días a todos y Good todas. morning to all. We are opening here number 14 of the 181 period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, which is entitled Situation of Human Rights in the Context of the Pandemic in Honduras. My name is Julia Mantilla Falcón. I'm the first vice president of the commission. And today with me are Commissioner Joel Hernandez, country reporter, and Commissioner Estuardo Rallon, that is reporter for persons deprived of their liberty and for the prevention and combat of torture. Today with us, we have the Assistant Executive Secretary of Monitoring, Maria Claudia Pulido. We also have uh, Ms. Isabel Albaladejo, that is the representative of the Office of the High Commissioner in Honduras. And this uh, hearing was requested by the CELS and by the CONADEF or uh, CONFADEF of Honduras. And I would like to greet also the representatives of the state. I would like to give you some details before beginning. I would like to say that we have a digital, digital tool and our platform that will be measuring uh, the time uh, you are presenting. We also have simultaneous interpretation and we have closed captioning. Uh, in addition, these hearings are being streamlined in, uh, are being streamed on social media. Please remember, I would like to remind you that we, you should have your cameras on and mute yourselves unless you are taking the floor. I would like to tell you how this hearing will be structured. First, we will have civil society organizations speaking for 20 minutes and the state will have the floor for 20 minutes. Then I would like to give the floor to the expert of the United Nations. And then we will have the participation of the commissioners and additional comments by the parties. I would like to thank all of you for being here and I would like to give the floor to civil society organizations for 20 minutes. I don't know who is the member of civil society who will take the floor. No sé qué organización de la sociedad civil va a empezar. I don't know uh, which organization of the civil society will take the floor. Berta, would you like to go first? You go first. Good morning. Thank you. Sorry, I had a technical issue. Uh, for me, it is a pleasure to greet uh, the honorable commissioners and the commission's team. Good morning. Good morning to the representative of the High Commissioner of Human Rights of the United Nations. Good morning to the official representatives of the state of Honduras. I would like to say that I have the honor of being accompanied by the cells uh, with Heidi Amaya, who is a victim uh, because he has suffered inhuman and degrading treatment and has suffered violations of her human rights. Also, we have Jaime Alvarado, that is the brother of, uh, who is the brother of a person who was murdered by um, public uh, or state forces. Also, we have Adrián Argueta, who is the sister of Adrián Argueta um, and Adrián Argueta, uh, whose sibling was murdered by uh, real police. Also, we have Mary Arguesa, that is a member of the COFADE. I would like to say today that human rights are, do not belong to an ideology. They are universal rights. And as a result, we support the victims in their search for justice, especially in the current times. 
in the COVID-19 times, when in Honduras, constitutional individual uh, guarantees have been suspended. We have uh, seen that there are several measures that are against law and against justice and that constitute violations of human rights. In order to account for what we've been living in our country due to the suspension of constitutional guarantees, um, the first um, surprise or the first thing that happened to us as uh, family members of victims of forced disappearance and other violations we see that there are uh, different forced disappearance cases. We have 17 people who have disappeared over this time. And it's a very specific record that we have. And we see that 17 people have disappeared. Likewise, we have a record of death that is unprecedented and there is no justification or explanation for that. We see that several women have been murdered over this time. We have 278 people or women who have died, who have been murdered during 2020 and 235 women have been murdered so far this year. We've seen massacres across the country during the pandemic. In 2020, we have uh, recorded 30 massacres and 43 massacres this year. There is no explanation of what we are living since the suspension of constitutional guarantees. We see that we have a highly militarized country. And these are some of the outcome of that situation. We have murders and arbitrary executions and summary executions. We have recorded them and we know that they occur across the country. And the perpetrators are the national police, are the military police and are also military officers. And the uh, response of the state is absolute denial. We have no access to justice. And we are here to present the case of Luis Argueta because we have done all the legal actions available. We have presented all the legal actions available, but we have no access to justice. And therefore, the victims are considered perpetrators and the perpetrators are considered victims. That's a modality that we see in our country in recent times. And as a result, um, we decided to go before the Inter-American Commission to present this issue to avoid new violations of human rights and to avoid the repetition of crimes, especially in this situation of family members that are seeking justice. And we have not been able to access justice. Um, it's uh, difficult to think that in our country there is a lack or there is a, several issues with the rule of law and with democracy. And we would like to say that the situation of human rights in Honduras is deteriorating more and more and that we are extremely concerned. And this is a request. We want the commission to uh, pay special attention to some new laws that have been discussed in Congress, some new bills that are about to be enacted. And we said all the rights uh, that we have acquired will be lost if those bills are passed and if they are, the laws are enacted because in recent times during the pandemic, we have laws uh, that uh, promote impunity and that are against 
access to justice. I would uh, wrap up here my presentation because I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. I would like to give the floor to Luciana from CELS. Thank you, Berta, honorable commissioners. Thank you for being here. The CELS is providing support to our as brothers and sisters from COFADE. We are really concerned about the situation of human rights in Honduras. As you know, the COVID and the emergency has led to several responses. There are 110 countries around the globe that have established states of emergency. And several organizations of human rights have warned about the violations of human rights that could be uh, derived from this state of emergencies. It has been warned that the policies should not be used for repressive actions or to violate the human rights of opponents and human rights defenders. We know that the state of Honduras did not apply international standards and the commission recommended at the I made several recommendations to states at the beginning of the pandemic that were not followed by the state of Honduras. As Berta said, there is an abusive use of force by police officers, by special forces and by the army. And today we will uh, hear the testimonies of some of the victims firsthand. Some rights such as freedom of expressions were suspended and we see that there has been a suspension of several constitutional guarantees. And after restoring these rights, we saw different attacks and executions because tear gas was shot against the journalists in some uh, protests. Also, um, there was a result, uh, the cells uh, or the commission made a recommendation regarding uh, the protection of vulnerable groups and the state of Honduras has not followed that recommendations. This had led to an increase in uh, the social tension because many people have no access to any livelihood. As a result, there were several social protests who were violently repressed. We have the case of Christian Espinosa, Espinosa a 26-year-old artist who was injured by uh, anti-riot police officers. The agents attacked him with uh, water um, and uh, the pressure of the water hurt Christian's eyes and eyelashes. And he has suffered permanent uh, sight uh, problems. Also, we know that during the pandemic, a new criminal code was passed. This uh, criminal code includes uh, several uh, actions that include new uh, types for terrorism and several other crimes. And what we see that after the violent repressions in 2017, several situations repeated again, and family members are uh, facing several barriers to access justice. The commission had defined this situation as structural impunity in 2019 and said that this could imply or could lead to the repetition of serious human rights violations. And that's what we are uh, witnessing right now. We see with concern that the state of emergency has led to an increase in militarization in Honduras, especially when uh, the, or in spite of the fact that the commission, de alguna manera, responden a una lógica militar del manejo de la crisis, y esperamos que la audiencia de hoy dé el espacio para comenzar a revertir estas tendencias. Le quiero pasar ahora la palabra a Heidi Amaya Rubio, que nos contará su testimonio. Gracias. Gracias. Buenos días nuevamente. Yo soy Heidi Amaya, víctima de abuso policial. El día 20 de mayo del 2020, en el marco de la pandemia, habían restricciones para circular, circulábamos por el último dígito de nuestra tarjeta de identidad. Hello, during the pandemic, we couldn't go around the city, we could only go around considering the last name on our ID card number. 
and my village is militarized and I needed to do some things at the bank and I asked my brother Roberto to go with me first because the village is completely militarized and secondly because I was afraid of the COVID-19. After one street we had the first police control. In the first control there were police officers from the municipality, national police officers, and military officers. And let me explain why is it that my brother was there with me and I explained to them why my brother was there with me, even though his ID number was not supposed to go around the town, they let us go. And after going to the two banks in the center of my town, there were two police officers that stopped us. We, respecting the law and them, decided to stop. And they requested our IDs and they asked whether we had weapons. We said, no, we don't have any weapons. And when I tried to explain that my brother was there just to be with me and that we were authorized to go by after the first police control, they did not say a word. They aggressively took him off the car. The car was still on. And I started asking, what's wrong? Why are you doing this? And when I saw that he was being attacked, I immediately called my family to let them know that we were detained and that Roberto was being assaulted. That's the only thing I said. And I felt that they attacked me from the back. They took my phone and they, they started assaulting me. They were punching me in my face. They were kicking me, attacking me. There were like 11 men, police officers, assaulting us, attacking us with so much hate. My brother was so mistreated. And just by remembering what they did to him, so after that, they, they took us in, they forced me to remove my shoelaces and I did it slowly because I was waiting for my family to arrive. And then they held us for three hours there. And after 20 minutes of being there, we heard this horrible noise and my, my brothers screamed and said, hey, dear, are you OK? And I said, yes. And I said, and you? Yes. Because at that moment, we thought that we were going to be killed. And it is worth mentioning that when they took us in, they removed all of the biosafety measures. They removed our masks, our gloves, the bags, the plastic bags that were covering our shoes, they removed everything. And after two hours, we were so afraid. And since I felt like I was going to faint, I requested some water. And one of the female agents told me, if, if you want some water, I can give you this dirty water. And they didn't offer us any water. They refused to give us water. And we were there and they were still insulting us. And I said to them, I would get in touch with the human rights organizations because of all the unfair things that you did to us. We did not refuse to be pulled over. And they told us that doesn't exist here in Honduras. And at that point, we felt so alone with no protection whatsoever. And my family came in with the CONADE and the COFADE human rights organizations, and there was a lawyer there too. 
but we are still scared. My brother Roberto was threatened by a family member of one of the police officers, and we are scared. We feel totally unprotected in the system where we live. They know where we live and we live in constant fear and we are requesting justice because just like what happened to us, there are thousands of cases. Thank you. I'll give the floor now to Jaime, another victim of this system. Jaime was not able to connect, so we are going to give the floor to Adriana. Adriana, you have two minutes and 13 seconds. Adrian, sorry. Good morning, commissioners and human rights leaders. My name is Adrian Argueta. I am the brother of Rinel Argueta, who was killed by the police in our municipality on June the 20th of 2020. It is worth mentioning that we are a family that we've never had any problem with anyone. We've worked with cattle, that's what we do. And actually my brother was going very early to work we work in cattle raising, and when a police control, an improvised police control requesting him to pull over, they said that they were telling him to stop and he did not, and that's why they shot him and instantly killed him. And then they, after killing him, they remove all the evidence they went to the public ministry and they said that they had shot him because he did not agree to pull over and it was curfew time. Then the five officers involved in this case were not convicted. They were innocent for the judges involved. After shooting my brother and killing my brother, they were still defined or deemed innocent. So what happened with this? My brother was killed and there's so much impunity in this case and many other cases in my municipality. It's so difficult to live like this with my family damaged, leaving two children without their father, my mother without her son, and we as siblings are so afraid and we are being threatened every day. So we want to file this complaint against you because there is no justice whatsoever in our country. And all the security agents are working together and covering each other. And this is why we are reaching you because you should know the lack of justice that we are suffering in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's no more time for the civil society, but you will have a second chance to talk. And before giving the floor to the state, I would like to thank the civil society, but especially Heidi and Adrian for being here and telling us your story and offering us with your valuable testimony. Now I will give the floor to the state for 21 minutes. Honorable commissioners, petitioners, and other people, representative of the Office of the High Commissioner for HR, good morning. 
Let me congratulate and show our gratitude first to the heroes of this pandemic, doctors and all of those who showed solidarity during these tough times. We are here at this 181st period of sessions for the hearing situation of human rights in the context of the pandemic in Honduras. I am accompanied by a delegation that is composed by the DA's office, the Secretary of State, and offices of health, human rights, defense, and security. As you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic made all countries to run against the disease, which posed challenges in order to guarantee fundamental rights such as health and life, among others. The pandemic is a global crisis of our times, and it's the most important challenge that we as countries had to face. In Honduras, considering the pandemic, we had to temporarily suspend certain rights and guarantees, such as free circulation, restriction of rights, that was also adopted by many other countries during the pandemic. In our countries, this state of exception was based on Article 4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, on Articles 2 and 27 of the American Convention on Human Rights. It was necessary to do so through Decree PCM 005-2020 of February 10th, 2020. And we had to call the national emergency and we saw the situation expanding given the terrible health situation in the country, deepened by the devastating effects that we had with the tropical storms Etna and Ota, and through Decree 106, 2021, from October 1st, 2021, the state of exception was suspended. It is worth mentioning that the state of exception complied with what was established in the court, I, the, in the court of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, and also respecting the proper SONA principle in order to guarantee public health and the integral protection as established by the Commission on its Resolution 1, 2020. Honorable commissioners, with the aim of guaranteeing the right to access to information, transparency, and accountability, some mechanisms were created, such as a unique portal of processes to facilitate government processes. And in terms of transparency, also to inform the population the actions being implemented to fight the pandemic and the creation of the Secretariat of Transparency, among other actions. For the development of the topic right to life and health, I will give the floor to Dr. Carla Pavon, head of the surveillance and epidemiological control, and she will now continue. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. The measures adopted in the protection of life and health in the context of the COVID-19 and its results. Honorable commissioners, the state of Honduras recognizes that the pandemic brought about several challenges at the world level for health systems. And this is why we assumed with responsibility the right to life and health of our population. And today as the National Day for 
doctors in Honduras, being a doctor is to serve with love, responsibility, effort, and especially to restore health and the joy of our patients. And especially the respect for the life of our patients. So today I would like to congratulate all doctors in Honduras. And I will start by saying that the beginning of the pandemic in April 2020, and with the uncertainty of the behavior that this pandemic was going to have in terms of new people infected and death coming from this disease, several institutions in the country started forecasting cases and death among them, the University of Honduras. And these forecasts were very important for making preventive decisions in the first five months of the pandemic, because they were indicating that we were about to overflow the health capacity of the country. We were expecting a maximum of 2.8 million people infected by August 2020 with a lethality of 3% and 84,000 people dying and with the collapse of the health infrastructure of the country. And after receiving the recommendations of the WHO and those established by the health secretariats through the National Risk Management Center, and in order to face this new threat the right way, on March 16, 2020, Mr. the president of this country communicated the nation that there was going to be a state of exception in the entire country with the aim of preventing, reducing, or controlling the risk levels and death levels due to COVID-19, especially to safeguard the life of people in our national territory considering the technical and scientific criteria, the health secretariat in order to protect human lives, which is the most important goal for society and state, coordinated all public and private activities through plans, considering the emergency situation in order to establish the epidemiological control in order to guarantee, prevent, research, diagnose, and carry out the surveillance of infectious diseases and the possibility of them being contagious. And as a result of all the measures taken, there was a different behavior to our initial forecasts. And in 2020, we ended up with 120,000 cases and more than 300 deaths and this as a consequence of the measures taken, including the lockdown, the use of biosafety measures, and the use of the right responses from the clinical and medical point of view. Through this control of the pandemic by the health secretariat, in Honduras, we are continuing the right actions that we started at the beginning of these events in spite of the international inequality to acquire personal protection equipment, respirators, antiviral meds, lab inputs, including vaccines. And considering the catastrophic landscape that we expected, we had the main goal of protecting human life and considering the current situation in Honduras from the beginning as of today is 374, 569 people with the disease, with the disease and 10,200 people who died. And also the population campaigns that were designed for vulnerable groups like elderly people, those in prisons, etc. This reflects that 35% of the population that was vulnerable received the full scheme of vaccines and 67% received at least one shot of the vaccine. And we are seeing the positive impacts of the vaccines against COVID-19 in our country up to the degree that hospital occupation went down considerably and also the mortality of the virus. And all of these, after being confined, 
And luckily, we did not reach that 2.8 million people infected and more than 80,000 people dying. And this is because the measures that we established. Of course, we are sorry for the 10,000 people who died in our country. And in order to continue with the development of the hearing, I will give the floor to Mr. Danilo Morales, lawyer from the Secretariat of Human Rights. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I would like to talk about the measures taken to guarantee human rights protection in the state of exception. We consider the specific situation of human rights defenders, social communicators, and journalists. And we call upon those organizations to continue with their work in this context, always in order to guarantee the observance of human rights, taking into consideration the competencies of the protection system of the Secretary of Human Rights, we have paid a specific attention to protect journalists, social communicators, and human rights defenders during the pandemic. Within the system, I would like to mention some of the actions that we have taken. Even that we have the executive uh, decree PCM 005 2020 that limit freedom of expression and freedom of express, uh, press. And in spite of this decree, the Secretary of Human Rights is promoting a reform to that decree through the uh, executive decree PCM 022 2020 in order to guarantee freedom of expression and freedom of movement to social communicators, journalists, and human rights defenders so that they can continue with their communication work. We also uh, had a specific area in our website to receive requests of protection. Uh, the emergency line 24 7 has been kept active in 2020, the technical committee uh, conducted 155 meetings and 114 meetings were digital out of them. And also the committee conducted 11 sessions and nine of them were virtual. Currently this year, the technical committee is conducting digital meetings as of September, up to September 115 meetings were held and the National Council of Protection conducted five ordinary sessions, one extraordinary session, and two working meetings. All those were held online. The Technical Committee and the National System of Protections and the Secretariat of Human Rights through its several, their several communications to governmental agencies and also press releases highlighted the role of journalists and social communicators. During 2020, 43 requests were taken, only 19 were admitted. Up to December 2020, during the confinement, 20 requests of protections were uh, taken and 10 were admitted. In 2021, between January and September, we received 50 requests, only 22 were admitted. Uh, 11 were human rights defenders, three were social uh, communicators, seven were justice operators, and one was from a journalist. We are trying to provide support to human rights defenders in the implementation of the protection measures. In 2020, 460 protection measures were implemented, uh, taking into consideration uh, the rights of uh, security that we have. And in 2021, we have implemented 348 protection measures so far. In 2020, we have the technical assistant, assistant program of the European Union in order to provide comprehensive protection to the persons that were identified. We have a protocol for the follow-up of these protection measures within the framework of the pandemic or similar situations. And we also had a specific uh, comprehensive monitoring system, especially to address urgent protection measures. This was done in the framework of the pandemic and similar situations. In order to continue with the order of the hearing, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Nelson Molina. Honorable commissioners, the state of Honduras would like to highlight that during this year, it has sent timely and detailed information uh, before uh, to address the different requests of the Inter-American Commission according to Article 48 of the American Convention. We have answered eight requests. Four of them uh, are addressed uh, or address the issues of this hearing. One has to do with access to the COVID-19 vaccine with a human rights perspective. 
also the conditions of detention and prevented with detention in Honduras, also the violation of freedom of expression right of the uh, people in Honduras, and also the alleged disappearance of four people in Honduras. This shows the willingness of the state of Honduras to provide responses before the Honorable Commission. Regarding what the petitioner said in written, they said that there were 200 uh, arbitrary detentions, but that information is wrong. According to the Security Secretariat, we uh, identified 80,000 uh, detentions because of the violations of the uh, exception um, decrease. Um, taking into consideration the uh, information provided by the petitioners, we would like to say that the AG office, the Secretariat of Security and other entities of the government has presented several measures in order to address the situation. And we are going to share this information with you after the hearing. We would like to request the organizations in the hearing to provide more information about the cases that they are denouncing in order to follow up on that specific cases. So far, we don't have sufficient information to pronounce on those cases. So therefore, we need more information to be able to identify these specific cases. Uh, in the case of uh, Kayla Martinez, we know that uh, there is a police officer that is has been detained. Um, this was done following the protocol or the Latin American protocol for the violent death of women. And we also received the advice of the Office of the High Commissioner uh, in Honduras. We follow the recommendations 7 and 13 of the IACHR after its in local visit in Honduras in 2018. With regard to the actions of the state through the Secretariat of Security, we made our efforts in order to keep the public order to persecute and combat crime in order to guarantee peace uh, among the um, population in Honduras. Uh, in the case of violations of human rights by police officers, those cases are being investigated by the competent authorities. It's also important to show uh, the rest of the uh, people present in this hearing to show the different actions that were taken by the state because we needed to serve, uh, protect the borders in order to contain the spread of COVID-19. Additionally, the armed forces provided support to the Secretariat of Health in the implementation of health emergency plans and also have supported the national police to keep the public order. And we also provided humanitarian aid to population as part of the program Honduras Solidaria, which was created in 2020. These actions were conducted according to the constitutional mandate of the armed forces. This did not imply a militarization of the country. In order to comply with gender measures in the pandemic, the Hondur state of Honduras would like to say that uh, violence against women has increased and it has taken timely measures. We have increased the participation of women's organizations and we would like to recognize their work within the framework of the hidden uh, sexual and reproductive uh, rights in Honduras. In the previous period of sessions of the commission, the state informed about the measures that were adopted in this regard. However, in this present hearing, we would like to measure some of those measures, the approval of emergency law for women in the context of the COVID-19 in order to have a campaign of massive information in media outlets in order to inform and educate population regarding the different uh, forms of violence against women. The Institute of Women designed a campaign in order to promote changes in behavior in adult population. We have the platform Connecta with a gender observatory and a virtual school uh, that had the support of uh, or that was supporting the different initiatives that I mentioned before. We have also a gender violence initiative and an emergency line. Um, and also the um, judiciary is having a specific uh, gender violence uh, court. During the confinement of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are working together with different women's organizations with the feminicide committee and all these actions will be expanded in the report we submit before the commission. Honorable commissioners, 
Now we will continue uh, presenting during the Q&A session. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to Isabel Avaladejo, that is the representative of the OECHR in Honduras. Thank you. Good morning, honorable commissioners, uh, delegates and distinguished delegates. It's an honor to be addressing you. I would like to thank this opportunity on behalf of the office of the OECHR before uh, in Honduras. And I would like also to thank the petitioners. I also would like to greet the representatives of the state of Honduras. My contribution to this hearing of the 181st period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission I as big uh, in my capacity, capacity as representative of the OACHR in the country. My goal is to report the Inter-American Commission verbally. And nothing of what I said today is a disclaimer of the privileges of the United Nations according to Convention 146 in this matter. We have summarized the main impacts of the pandemic uh, in four areas, the right to health, the restrictions of uh, the in the exercise of some fundamental rights, access to justice, and also the full enjoyment of human rights, especially for people that are in a specific situation of vulnerability. In terms of the right to health, our office has stressed the several limitations of the health system in Honduras. Also, we identified the lack of preparation to address this health crisis. In October, uh, on October the 11th, um, Honduras um, overcame the 10,000 people who died of the virus. Unfortunately, this figure could be doubled according to alternative sources. The crisis has affected the health uh, staff and professionals who have uh, reported that the lack of resources and the adequate biosafety secure, uh, conditions. When it comes to fundamental rights and the exercise in the civic space, I would like to highlight that on March 15, 2020, as a response of the first cases of COVID-19 in the country, the government issued um, executive decree to declare the state of exception. This decree imposed restrictions on freedom of expression and extended detention parameters with, uh, beyond 24 hours. This emergency Emergency measures should be based on the principles of proportionality, legality, and non-discrimination. And because of this recommendation by the IACHR, the government changed or reformed the decree. The, decree. the state of exemption was uh, effective until October the 1st, 2021. The office has identified that there were several practices that were not complying with uh, the recommendations. These actions could constitute illegal or arbitrary detentions. We also see that there was a generalized use of the military forces and many of the detentions were illegal or arbitrary. As of June to last year, the um, authorities recorded 31,000 detentions. Uh, but we see that in la last year, there were over 85,000 people who were detained. Um, the protests and the demonstrations were constant. Um, our office has recorded uh, over 1,600 demonstrations, such as uh, the reasons for those demonstrations had the lack of food, or for example, we have some protests against uh, the government. We have seen that the military police and the armed forces have participated in security operations in a context of militarization of the public security. It's necessary to advance on a progress to demilitarize uh, the streets. We have also documented that the response to the security forces has include the excessive use of force, which have led to serious violations of human rights. Apart from the excessive use of force and lethal force, our office has documented two cases of extrajudicial executions by public forces that were acting because of the uh, state of emergency. We also have eight victims of forced disappearance. As of today, and in spite of all the provisional measures issued, 
by the Inter-American Court, we don't know the whereabouts of the disappeared persons and no advances have made regarding the investigations of those cases. We also see that the actions of the Ombuds uh, person office were limited. During this year, 2021, our office has recorded 219 events and attacks against human rights defenders. This includes um, campaigns to uh, discredit them and including violent attacks or murders. Uh, there are some protection measures that were granted by national or international bodies. It's also important to alert the Inter-American Commission about the serious consequences in the area of human rights of the reform of the criminal code, which the Congress passed uh, last October. The punishment for the usurpation crime has important implications for the work of human rights defenders and environmental defenders. As the third point, I would like to refer to access to justice and the investigation of corruption cases. The pandemic has affected the functioning of the justice system that was already failing. We are seeing a reduction in the number of judicial activity and we see delays that have led to an increase of pending cases. There is a lack of protocols regarding the holding of hearings. And this includes emblematic cases such as the Berta Cáceres case. Our office is concerned that several detention centers did not comply with the prevention measures. And this affected the rights of persons deprived of their liberty, liberty, including torture, degrading treatment, as it was already presented in a previous hearing conducted by the commission. The office is also concerned regarding the violent events in detention centers, especially during the most critical months of the health emergency in 2020 and 2021. Our office had provided uh, technical assistance to the Supreme Court of Justice with a special emphasis on the situation of persons deprived of their liberty, but we are concerned that human rights defenders and environmental defenders and land defenders such as Wapinol defenders did not access to uh, measures that would replace preventive detention. Also, there is a legislation that relaxed the hiring and tender processes in the state. Direct purchases are now the norm, not the exception. We see that there is a lack of transparency and cases of corruption in terms of the management of funds, and this should be investigated in a thorough way. The commission uh, has said that these corruption cases affect several people, and this undermines the rule of law and has an impact on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. Regarding the impact of the pandemic on a specific vulnerable groups, in order to conclude, I would like to highlight that the impact of the pandemic, but also the hurricanes, Zeta and Ota have increased the structural inequalities that exist, especially affecting those situations in a vulnerable situations, including women, indigenous peoples, LGBTI persons, and situations in human mobility among other groups. The pandemic has stressed the failure of the social protection system in Honduras. In 2019, 58% of the active population was working in the informal sector without access to any welfare benefits or social protection benefits. And the situation worsened because of the pandemic. The pandemic also worsened the situation of structural violence against women. These reports show that these cases increased in critical months in 2020, especially during the confinement period. Also, as of uh, up to September 2021, our office re uh, recorded over 200 violent deaths of women, especially the case of Mrs. Martinez, who was killed under police custody after being detained for violating the uh, confinement uh, regulations. This is the first case of a police uh, or a security officer being uh, prosecuted for a case of this type. I would like to highlight that the pandemic has also increased the vulnerability of indigenous peoples and affected their rights to food, health, attention, and their right to health. And we have police and military controls at the entrance of indigenous peoples, and this limited their access to food. Also, the restrictions of freedom of movement affected the rights of migrants 
who uh, were not able to cross the borders or access to health centers. In 2020, at least three big caravans were reported, one of them of 4,000 people. In 2021, we have reported two caravans, one of them with over 7,000 people. In 2021, we see that 41,000 uh, people have been um, exposed expelled from the United States and Mexico. And this includes children and adolescents. Also the suspension of schools also affected the situation of girls, boys and adolescents. Almost 50% of the students with uh, lower resources are outside the education system since they did not have access to internet. We are really concerned about the situation of girls, boys and adolescents um, because uh, they have their education suspended, partially or totally. I would like to conclude by highlighting that in Honduras, and measures are now more flexible since there is a reduction in the cases of COVID-19, but the emergency is still there and we have serious concerns in the area of human rights. As a result, we call upon the state of Honduras to guarantee human rights as an important aspect of the reconstruction plan by paying specific attention to vulnerable groups, also to provide protection in order to guarantee public guarantees, especially constitutional rights and freedom of expression, and also to guarantee access to justice and to fight corruption. Our office, we would like to reaffirm our willingness to continue working with all the sectors in order to advance on the respect and guarantee of human rights. Thank you. We've given you a couple more minutes because you know that you have some UN formalities. And now we are going to start with the participation of the commission. And I will ask Mr. Hernandez any questions. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to say hello to Heidi Amaya and Adrian Argueta. I am here with you and your testimonies were very emotional and they show part of the reality that is presented today in this hearing. I would like to say hello to the SCOs, Ms. Berta, Ms. Mary, congratulations for the work that you are constantly doing throughout time in human rights. And I would like to say hello also to the representation of the state in Honduras. And I would like to thank Ms. Isabel Albaladejo for giving us an overview of the situation of human rights in Honduras in the framework of the pandemic. Without a doubt, the pandemic has affected countries in the region and in the world. We know that there were some setbacks in the exercise of human rights all over the world. And considering that we are about to reach the end of the pandemic, scenarios are still not very clear in terms of how the states will resume their work after the health emergency. However, what we've heard today is very revealing of a situation of impairment of human rights in the country. It is clear what is the legal foundation for issuing the decrees for the state of exception, but also there are two parameters in international law for the extension of those states of exception. And they were mentioned and one of them is the question of timing. We know that these decrees are no longer in order in terms of this temporality, but I think that it would be okay to analyze the application of these decrees in the framework of the pandemic, especially to determine whether there were excessive uses of authority during that state of exception, and they shall be then investigated, sanctioned, and victims must be then compensated. The numbers offered today create a huge concern. We are talking about 80,000 administrative detentions, 
340 disappearances, eight victims of forced disappearances, 200 violent deaths of women, one case of femicide, the case of Kayla Martinez, the abuse of preventive custody, like in the case of Guapinol, the general situation of the abuse of preventive custody in the penitentiary system are reasons for us to be concerned. And they make us ask the state about the measures that you adopted in the framework of the pandemic. Especially, it is very important to know whether you have a record of the number of people that were detained within the framework of the state of exception. And we would like to know whether you started any criminal procedure after those detentions or if these were administrative temporary detentions that are no longer in force. We would like for you to explain if the state of Honduras has a record of people who are disappeared. We are very much concerned about people who were victims of forced disappearance. And let me conclude with a final request. I would really like for Heiji and Adrian to share with us what were the complaints presented due to the vulnerations that they suffered before what authorities and if there was an investigation of those facts. That is all, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Now, Mr. Rallon, Commissioner Rallon has the floor. Thank you to my colleagues. And I would like to greet the members of the civil society, Heidi, Adrian, and other representatives of the state and the representative of the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in Honduras. First of all, I would like to express my solidarity and acknowledge the courage of Heiji and Adrian for coming here and telling us about the tough situations that they had to go through with their families. And they offered us in the commission a very important image that should be attended by the state so that these very serious situations do not happen again. And also for the necessary investigations and sanctions can be done so as not to have impunity. And considering the title of this hearing today, the situation of human rights in the context of the pandemic has allowed us to hear some efforts conducted by the state, for example, with the health system fighting against a critical situation such as the pandemic. But I do feel that there is a very important part that we have not heard of, which is also fundamental, which are situations of serious violations of human rights American. that should be investigated and prioritized in the presentation, I did not hear any clear comments on the mechanisms to search disappeared people. And this would be then a question for the state. What is the search mechanism to attend or solve this serious situation of people disappeared? Also, I would like to know if you are investigating the serious situations for facts like Heidi described, or the case of Adrian with the death of his brother. Are you investigating these cases that we heard today and other similar to the ones that they described? So is there a commitment from the state of show sympathy or empathy for the victims and knowing that these 
serious human rights violations must be prioritized. And of course, we've received the data and the information of other lines of action. But without mentioning that what we heard today should receive priority and corresponds to the international obligations that the country has in the matter of human rights. So I would like to know if they are searching disappeared people and how they are taking care of these serious vulnerations. Additionally, there was an intervention that referred to arbitrary detentions and the number that the state had was 80,500 approximately, and they said that they were going to be sending information in writing about this situation. So I would like for this situation to be complemented in writing because this will help us have a more complete scenario and also the state's perspective. So basically, these are my comments. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner. I will ask some questions before giving the floor to my colleagues. First, and as Commissioner Rallon said, we've been offered information about how the state of Honduras responded to this terrible crisis of the pandemic. Very recently, the commission received information on how for more than 10 years, all the vaccine agreements were being kept. So I would like to know if this is the case. And secondly, what is the reason? We reviewed the media and we found some information that this was a requirement by the pharma companies. But I would like to know if this is the case and if it's actually pharma companies demanding this. Now, in terms of violation of human rights in this context, even though I appreciate the information about how the state of emergency was suspended, I would like to know if during this state of emergency, what happened with legal resources, habeas corpus or resources known as amparos, were they kept or were they suspended? And along this same line, and as Ms. Albaladejo from the UN explained or mentioned the participation of the armed and police forces in emergency states or in the process of the emergency state. I would like to know what happened and remembering the case law of the court, it should be a restricted participation only related to what is strictly necessary in a proportionate way. And finally, I would like to specifically discuss the situation of cases of sexual violence that might have happened beyond the homicides and terrible figures that we've heard of, I would like to ask the state first, do attention protocols and the trainings that the armed forces and the police receive, do they include the prevention in the cases of sexual violence? This first and secondly, as my colleagues asked about the numbers of people detained and disappeared, is there an established mechanism to record cases of sexual violence? And what is the information that you have about that? And in a specific way, I would like to respectfully ask, apart from thanking Haiti and Adrian, I would like to ask Haiti and organizations in general, whether they know cases where there were situations of sexual violence, which are not only rape, but also the threat of rape, and touching them in a wrongful way in cases of detentions within this framework of the state of emergency. So I would like to ask Maria Claudia Pulido, the monitoring secretary, if she has any question or comment. Thank you very much, first Vice President. I would like to greet everyone present in this room and just one comment. The commission is right uh, right now conducting two reports that we believe are relevant considering the situation being posed in this hearing. First, a report about the pandemic and human rights where the commission will include a cross perspective according to the contention 
and prevention measures adopted by the states in light of the COVID-19 and how they impacted on human rights. So the information presented here was very important and we're going to gather that for our report. Also, the commission is working on its follow-up report for the recommendations issued in the country report for Honduras and the information presented by the state and the SCOs and the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. This is all very relevant for this information. And I would like to ask whether you would like to stress on the recommendations that we should concentrate on in this report for pandemic and human rights and for the follow-up report for Honduras. This is it. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I am going to give the floor to Soledad Garcia, the reporter for Redesca. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the information that we've received and I would like to express my solidarity to human rights defenders in Honduras. First of all, I would like to refer to the right to health, which is of an important concern in my work in the commission. And as was expressed, by the UN representative in Honduras, we are also aware of the limitations that the state is facing in order to protect and guarantee the right to health of their citizens. So in this regard, I would like to thank the state for the information received related to vaccines. This is information that we are processing now for our annual report. And I have an additional question after what Commissioner Yulisa asked, and it is, you said that you have 60% of your population vaccinated with the first shot, especially priority groups. So you do have priority groups like the health staff, and you talked about 100 health staff who passed away. So I would like to know if they are all vaccinated now. And also during the hearing, I did not hear about social protection measures such as grants or some sort of aids for people in special vulnerability situation or poverty, extreme poverty. This is an issue of concern for us in Honduras and in the entire region. And considering the citizen protest for the right to a job, to food, those people who are forcibly returned to Honduras, even though they try to leave the country, is there a specific program for those people? And of course, I am at your disposal to contribute with the state of Honduras and the civil society in these efforts. And also let me tell you that this year, the San Salvador Protocol Working Group issued its final observations on the Honduras report, which is also a very valuable tool for the state and the civil society in terms of follow-up. And finally, Madam Vice President, I would like, and probably the country rapporteur will consider this as an important gesture from the Commission and the Redesca. I would like to talk about the ruling Busos Mezquitos versus Honduras. And this is the case of the Mezquito divers. And this is a very important gesture for us and we appreciate it. And from the Commission, we are at the disposal of the state for this ruling to be complied with in order to benefit that area of Honduras. Thank you very much, Madam President, Vice President. Okay, so now we're going to give 10 minutes to the civil society for their final remarks. Thank you very much. I will use part of this time to present our requests for the commission. We request for 
the dematerialization, the progressive dematerialization to be retaken, reducing the capacities of the military forces in public security. Moreover, we would like for the police not to use firearms in the control of social protest and to regulate the use of less lethal weapons to investigate and sanction the arbitrary sanctions in the context of social protest for the conditions to be guaranteed in all in order to progress or make progress with the human rights violated in this context also to give help to the can to the families of those who had their human rights violated and to protect the integrity of the petitioners and to end with the harassment situations as Ms. Heidi Amaya said and how her family ha has been harassed and persecuted to guarantee the right to protest and to meet the right to life, personal integrity and freedom for all the people protesting and to guarantee the freedom of expression and to finish the attack to journalists, to review the criminal figures introduced in the new criminal code that might affect public protests, such as adequating to the international standards what is related to social protest and terrorist association, among others, to guarantee that they won't use any aggravated criminal figures that will imply the intervention of national courts and taking the those find guilty to maximum security prisons to guarantee the presumption of innocence of them and to guarantee their right to freedom. So we would like to request to the Honorable Commission to establish a mechanism of assessment and follow up with the participation of the civil society to guarantee the implementation of these recommendations that were already formulated last month to the state. Thank you very much. And now I will give the floor to Hey, dear Maya, and then to Adrian, so that they can answer the questions asked by the commissioners. Thank you. With regard to the question you asked about my case, uh, the, per, the uh, organization that was uh, Dealing with the case is the COFADE. We have presented the complaint and up to now nothing has been resolved. But the COFADE uh, has been dealing with the case. On October the 11th, 2021, um, we presented a complaint before the public prosecutor office against, uh, we present a complaint against four police officers who have been identified because of illegal detention. The COFADE is, uh, uh, has been supporting me and is presenting the case on my behalf. And as for the other question, whether we know about other cases of abuse, I would like to say that there are some things that I did not mention because when I uh, thought about what happened to me, I got very nervous. I get very nervous. Um, but during the detention, I was not only punched. I was not, I did not receive only verbal or physical aggressions. They touched me. They did not respect anything. And they uh, attacked me more because I did not allow them to touch me. And there was some uh, physical violence because of, because of that. Thank you. Adrián you, Adrián, you can take the floor. Uh, in our case, 
Our situation is unbelievable. We arrived to the scene of the crime and my brother was lying there, dead. And um, the courts of Atacama were dealing the case, but we realized that the people who were in charge of the case were investigation police, not judicial authorities. So we have policy officers investigating police officers. Uh, that's incredible. Our work, as I said before, uh, requires us to be early in the farm to work with the cattle. And they shot people. And the courts only say that they don't know who was the police officer that killed him. So all the police officers are considered or are declared innocent. This really hurts us. We don't know how to understand the situation because um, the police officers said they shot, but since nobody uh, knows who shot him, they are just declared innocent. Uh, the impunity of this case is painful. You just want to leave this country because of the justice system that we have here. That is what I wanted to clarify. Thank you, Adrian. Luciana, would you like to add anything? We have four minutes left. Or Bertha, would you like to take the floor? I will be very quick. After hearing the representatives of the state of Honduras, my country, it is clear that we live in two different countries. They live in a bubble and we live in a country where everything can happen and abuse and the lack of care for the lives of others is present. Honduras is a huge territory. And we have the case of Haiti, the case of Adrian, and they are just two cases of the several abuses and all the barbarian acts committed by the state of Honduras through its state agents across the country. It's important also for me to mention that most of the actions of police officers when they detain a woman are bad. They act with no respect at all. The levels of impunity that we have witnessed in the country are alarming. We cannot say that the rule of law is being implemented or that it exists. We don't have a rule of law here. Uh, the state is fully negligent. The judicial system has collapsed. Today, there are two important actions that are being carried out in the country. One, the initial hearing of the Keila Martinez case. Uh, the representatives of the defense for that case, of the, the representatives of the victim for that case is Akufade. Um, we know who the perpetrators are, the, but also we have identified that there is a system that is protecting the person that has been prosecuted. That person is being protected by the Ministry of Security. Uh, the Ministry of Security considers that this person is responsible, but they have uh, they they are paying for representatives for the legal representatives. Uh, we don't believe that the person that is being prosecuted for the case can pay for the fees of so expensive lawyers. We 
know that this is not the first case that is being processed. They have changed the justice system. And then we have the case, another case that is the Guajiro case. But there is an, an element that we need to take into consideration. We need to consider that in Honduras, we have political prisoners. We are taking people out of the country. Kayla Martinez's sister is now uh, exiled because her con uh, security conditions were very poor. So we took her out of the country. We're working for that. I believe that urgently we need a psychosocial massive intervention in our country because the victims and those who support the victims are on one side and on the other side we have the state that is a perpetrator and they deny any type of actions and we believe that our state has this disease they do things but they deny what they do and that's what's happening in all the cases that we are presenting today. Thank you. Thank you for participating. I would like to give the floor to the state of Honduras. You have the floor for 11 minutes. Uh, with regard to the questions of how many people are vaccinated within the health sector, um, to be honest, we have a goal to vaccinate 95, 351 people. Um, but we have applied 105 doses or shots in the health sector, uh, including private and, pu uh, private and public institutions. This is a great joy because we were able to identify uh, that there was a reduction in the death of uh, health workers after the uh, implementation of the vaccine. We have some health workers who decided not to get vaccinated, but we have health workers with two shots and we one shot, especially as when uh, people have a special risk why they can die because of COVID-19. But we would like to say that most of our health workers are vaccinated. Um, we are already having a coverage of vaccines now, even though the access to vaccines we had at the beginning of the pandemic was limited. Uh, we are now uh, providing the second shots and the boosts, the booster shots. And um, most of the health workers are already vaccinated, as I said before. I just wanted to um, answer a question regarding access to vaccines. It's important to acknowledge that Honduras used the COVAX mechanism in order to have access to the vaccine. We received uh, high numbers of vaccines and now the vaccine rollout process in Honduras is permanent. In the purchase agreements, there are some clauses and two of the suppliers of the vaccines are limit access to information, especially related to prices, because of the their the competitive because of the competition that exists with regard to the prices of the vaccines. We are doing our best to get vaccines, and we know that there are other countries that are, are making the same effort. So that's the internal mechanism. And we are just respecting the clauses of the agreements we have with the suppliers. I would like to talk about the social protection system. We had the support of the Secretariat of Health in order to prepare food for uh, families in Honduras. 
we have food uh, boxes for families and we had the support of the uh, armed forces in order to provide families with food, especially for those families who were in uh, isolated. Um, because we had 0.7 million uh, people who got the disease. And fortunately, we did not have more infections and we were able to implement all these actions and that reduced the number of cases and the number of deaths. Thank you. Good morning. I'm writing on behalf of the Secretary of Security. And we should say that this state of emergency had several goals. We had several challenges on we know that the pandemic affected all countries around the world. The Ministry of Defense only supported uh, our uh, actions in order to keep the public order and to make the decrease effective. As a result, Um, the sound is really uh, failing, but the police has tried to contribute to these measures taken by the state in order to guarantee the public order. But it's also important to mention that this is not an institutional policy. On the contrary, we have our doors open. We are cooperating and working with the state agents and also with the public prosecutor office. We are trying to uh, prosecute all those responsible for violent acts. So we are going to share with the commission all the information to share to show you that the state has uh, conducted these actions to comply with the recommendations of the ICHR. Um, we would like to have a record, a record of all those persons uh, who have suffered the violent acts of, by state agents. We would like to show our solidarity to those who have suffered these violent acts. And we are at your disposal to help you find those responsible. This is an unfortunate fact. And on the contrary, we are really interested in uh, resolving these cases. And we would like also to say that the reform of the national police is not a danger. And what we are saying is that we are trying to do our best. Honorable commissioners, we would like to clarify that during the pandemic, the courts were never closed. They remain open, especially in the criminal area and also the constitutional court was open, especially uh, for the reception of writs of amparos and also the office of the public prosecutor was open. As representatives of the state, I have said, we are just talking about the matters of the present hearing, and we are going to submit the reports that you have requested in order to clarify or to provide an answer to the several questions that you have asked. Because of time restrictions, we cannot cover all those matters. We would like to say that we make efforts to guarantee equal access to health and to have a public health system that is solid and that is able to respond to the consequences of the pandemic on human beings without discrimination and with a special attention to the groups in a specific situation of vulnerability. In this context, the capacity of the state and the capacity of international regional mechanisms has, uh, uh, has been tested. We appreciate the cooperation of international human rights organizations to provide advice to the states in order to promote public policy with a human rights perspective. 
and people should be the ultimate goal of the state. We would like to show our uh, interest in continuing uh, keeping the dialogue with the Commission in order to improve the situation of human rights in Honduras. It is also important to say that the state of Honduras recently and for the first time is a member of the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. Uh, for the period 2022-2024. And this is a great opportunity to follow up on the promotion and protection of human rights. Uh, I would like to conclude this presentation by uh, saying that we are really sorry for the situations that have been presented in this hearing that affect some citizens of Honduras. And we would like to express our commitment so that these facts are clarified and that those uh, responsible are sanctioned. We have reports from the Public Prosecutor Office and from the Ministry of Justice, and we are going to send these reports to you so that you can verify the actions that are being taken. Uh, we know that there is a lot to be done, but we are willing to continue working to defend human rights. Thank you. Thank you. We are about to finish this hearing. I would like to thank you for your participation and for the information that you will send in writing, the requested information, and such information that you believe might be useful to complement what was said in this hearing, I would like to thank the state for their presence. And I would like to thank you for the information on the changes being done in the cooperation with the UN and with the very own commission. There are several topics that we did not discuss. The title of this hearing was the situation of human rights during the pandemic. But I know that the state will explain that afterwards in terms of mechanisms for investigation and sexual violence, etc. Also, as we always say from the Inter-American Commission, I would like to thank the organizations, not only for their presence today, but for their constant work in giving visibility, monitoring <clears throat> for everything related to human rights. I would like to say Ms. Albaladejo from the United Nations. And I would like to say to Adrian and Haiti, and I would like to say thank you for being here, but from the Inter-American Commission, each one of us in the team would like to express our solidarity for what you've been through, and we're going to keep on monitoring these facts. We're going to keep on accompanying you, and the Commission is the voice of human rights regardless of each state, each country, or each region. So the Commission would like to thank you for the huge contribution that you are doing for truth, justice, and compensation. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much.